You know, there probably isn't a more celebrated film series than Star Wars. Yeah, who would have thought that this little sci-fi space opera from the late 70s would become arguably the biggest franchise in cinema history? And we're not just talking about the classic trilogy or those other films, but we're talking countless novels, comic books, encyclopedias, and video games, all exploring and expanding the vast Star Wars universe. And then Disney bought Lucasfilm and made decades worth of content non-canon, also that they won't be creatively hindered in making the next set of films. Thanks, Disney! So, I've just been taking this time to reminisce on what could have been included in the new Star Wars films, and with Star Wars Rogue One just around the corner, I figured I'd have a look at this one game in particular. This is Star Wars Rebel Strike for the GameCube. Released in late 2003, Rebel Strike is the third and final game in the Rogue Squadron series, and like all Rogue Squadron games, it's an aerial combat game similar to the Star Fox series. However, this game has the added feature of foot and ground-based missions. The game takes place directly after the first Death Star offensive, with the first mission has you evacuating the Yavin 4 base. You control Luke Skywalker and pilot his X-Wing, pretty standard, but a great way to start off the game. The latter half of the mission has Luke Skywalker and Wedge Antilles on foot, rescuing the General from the main base. So right off the bat, we're introduced to both air combat and on foot combat, which is great. But it's a shame that being on foot controls like complete ass. Running and gunning feels clunky and unrefined. To shoot enemies, a reticule floats over a target and holding the L button locks onto it. The problem though is that it doesn't always seem to work. So I find myself mindlessly running through these missions due to the erratic aiming and non-existence of any cover-based mechanics. Back to the missions, the game's story is split into two halves, with one half focusing on Luke Skywalker and the other half on Wedge Antilles. In addition, there are also unlockable missions directly based off of films, such as Han Solo and Leia escaping the Hoth base, or the speeder bike chase on the Endor moon which I swear to Christ is the most infuriating level of this game because I had to restart this level four times to complete it. Holy shit! But that's not what we're interested in. No, we're interested in seeing original missions. Missions that show what happened between the episodes. Luke's campaign begins with a rescue mission on Dantooine. Tycho, an Imperial officer, defects to the Rebel Alliance and it's up to Luke to rescue him. This mission takes place on foot and is easily one of the worst levels. It's also literally one of the darkest levels, making the speeder bike sections nearly impossible. I had to turn up the brightness on my TV just to finish it. Although this level does introduce to us a new class of stormtrooper and probably the main antagonists of the game. Who are those guys? I've never seen stormtroopers like those. Those were storm commandos. They're elite soldiers responsible for carrying out special operations against the rebellion. The primary mission of the Storm Commandos is to acquire new technology for the Empire. They've been capturing teams of scientists from all over the galaxy. The next mission takes place on the planet Rall Tier, where you have to rescue a group of scientists. Here, you control an airspeeder and have to take out the invading Imperial forces. Awaiting your command. Attack my target. Engaging. And it's in these kinds of levels where the game really shines through. Just having the freedom of movement, flying around, destroying Imperial walkers. So much fun. That's all of them. Let's head down and see if we can help. The next mission brings things back to the ground. Commandeering an ATSD, you're tasked with escorting the scientists to the blockade runner. It's also here where Sarkley, your fellow Rogue Squadron member, defects to the Empire, that bastard. Controlling the ATSD is a lot of fun, and much like the flight combat, it's in these vehicle sections where the game's polish really shines through. Unlike this model, which is all dusty. Okay, so the walker controls may not be as good as flying, but it's still great to see the vehicle diversity of the game increased. So it's a real shame when you're forced back on foot again, clearing out the stormtroopers who have infiltrated the blockade runner. The rest of Luke's missions are directly based off events in the film, and they're all mostly on foot. The Battle of Hoth mission takes place right after Luke crashes his speeder. 
And sure, I guess it's kind of cool where you play the scene where Luke single-handedly destroys an AT-80. Twice, according to this game. But it's soon forgotten when you take control of an X-Wing and escort rebel transports away from Hoth, who get absolutely swarmed by invading TIE fighters. We lost transport one. Watch out for those TIE bombers. Ah! We lost transport two. Watch out for those TIE bombers. My reaches are at critical. Thanks for the escort, Luke. See you at the rendezvous point. The supposed greatest pilot of the Rebel Alliance, everybody. He's got an acceptable failure rate of 66 to 2 thirds percent. The numbers don't lie, Luke, and they spell disaster for you. Much like the film, the next mission takes place on Dagobah. This mission is basically a tutorial level on how to use the lightsaber and how to use the force. This would be cool, except that the unrefined on-foot controls prevent this mission from being fun. Also, there is only one other level where you have the lightsaber, and that's the next mission which takes place on Jabba's barge. Seriously, what's the point? The next two missions take place on the Endor moon, one of which is that cursed speeder bike level I mentioned earlier. The second one's way more interesting. You remember that scene in Return of the Jedi where Chewbacca and two Ewoks hijack an ATSD? Well, now you can play that part in full, technically making this the only mission where you're Chewbacca. But again, the latter half of this mission is on foot. This time you're Han Solo inside the shield generator base, setting detonation charges. Oh yeah, and Sarkley shows up as a storm commando and tries to kill Solo. He's then immediately wasted, that double crosser. There is one last film based mission where you control an A Wing in the Rebel attack against the Super Star Destroyer. Yes, that's right, you control that guy. Yes, that guy. The guy who destroyed the Super Star Destroyer by crashing into the bridge, the unsung hero of the Star Wars franchise. So that concludes Luke Skywalker's and the film based missions, and they were pretty good, I guess. But now I'm going to focus on the more interesting parts of the game, and that's the Wedge Antilles missions. Taking place after the Battle of Hoth, Wedge's first mission is a rescue mission above the planet Bakura, where you control a B-Wing. Ah yes, the B-Wing. One of the more interesting fighter crafts of the Star Wars universe. I mean, just look at it! Who the hell designed this thing? One of the Rebellion's most well-armed starfighters, the B-Wing, has been personally designed by Admiral Akbar. Oh, well that makes sense. I'm just a squid to design your ships and you're bound to come up with something fishy. Anyway, this mission involves using ion blasts to disable Imperial transports carrying captured scientists and then defending the rebel transports extracting said prisoners. What's interesting about this mission is that there are in fact two endings. The regular ending where an Imperial escort carrier shows up, destroys the rebel transport and then flees. The other, more interesting ending, shows Hobby, where his Rogue Squadron member, shot down and crash landing on the planet's surface. The latter part of the mission then becomes a rescue mission, where Wedge pilots a TIE bomber and rescues Hobby. This used to infuriate me as a kid, because I could never get the TIE bomber mission, no matter how many times I tried. And yet, when I was getting footage for this review, I got it on my first go. I still don't fully understand how it works. Something about getting a silver medal on this mission? It's never explained. No matter, because the overall ending of the mission is still the same either way, with the Imperial escort carrier retreating towards Geonosis. The next mission, in pursuit of the escort carrier, wedge in the Rebel fleet hyperspace to Geonosis and destroy it. Losing starboard stabilizer control! R5, can you lock down that stabilizer? I'm losing control! Okay, hang on! We're going down! Another fucking on foot section. You know, if I wanted to play a game where I'm running around on Geonosis, I'll play Star Wars Clone Wars. Wait a minute, I'm fighting battle droids and there's a Republic gunship wrecking shit? Holy crap, I am playing Star Wars Clone Wars. You will all pay. Ah! So you're telling me 
that Wedge Antilles here single-handedly takes out a fucking Republic gunship using nothing but an E-Web blaster. Why isn't Wedge Antilles considered the best pilot of the Rebel Alliance? Want more proof why Wedge is better than Luke? His expertise in piloting any ship, first a TIE bomber, and now a Jedi Starfighter. Or how about in the next mission, where he single-handedly takes out over a dozen TIE Hunters in his A-Wing, despite the fact that he's never seen them before? Or how about this? After a successful bombing run, in the next mission, Wedge is tasked with taking out the super laser wreaking havoc on the Rebel fleet. So what does he do? He lands in the middle of a war zone, hijacks an ATSD to go further into the facility. Then, he hijacks an AT-AT and destroys the super laser from the inside, all on his own. And here's more proof of Wedge's impeccable piloting skills. In the last of his missions, Wedge's squadron take control of TIE Hunters and escort a Rebel transport to collide with a shield generator protecting the construction site of a second Super Star Destroyer. And despite the fact that the TIE Hunter's armor is made of cardboard, as evidenced by me having to restart this mission four times, he pulls it off! He destroys the Super Star Destroyer in what is probably the weakest armored ship of the game. Not to mention, in Return of the Jedi, he was one of the pilots responsible for taking down the second Death Star. You see, Captain Wedge Antilles is a goddamn legend in the Star Wars universe, and his legendary status is reflected by his appearance in books, other video games, and heck, even in Star Wars Rebels, albeit in the days before he defected to the Alliance. So, this just begs the question, for such a pivotal character, where the fuck was he in The Force Awakens? Supposedly, the actor who portrayed Wedge in episodes 5 and 6, Dennis Lawson, was in fact approached by Lucasfilm if he would be interested in reprising his role in episode 7. He rejected it because it would, quote, bore him. With all due respect, Mr. Lawson, you get to be in Star Wars for goodness sakes, only the biggest science fiction franchise of the fucking galaxy. People would kill for such an opportunity. And fans love Wedge Antilles, and they want to know what happened to the Alliance's best pilot. I know I did. I was downright disappointed not seeing Wedge Antilles in The Force Awakens. Who do we get instead? Fucking Poe Dameron? Man, Poe Dameron ain't got shit on Wedge Antilles. And that's pretty much it. That was the last mission. Okay, fine, there's an endurance mission I left out, but I couldn't be bothered unlocking it. If you play each mission in succession, you can beat the game in under 6 hours, but there's a great amount of replayability, like trying to get gold medals on each level, or replaying missions as other ships. You got your regular assortment of X-Wings and Y-Wings, or heck, even the Millennium Falcon here, but that's not what we're interested in. Hmm, what we got here? Ah. The Slave 1. Ever wanted to pilot that? Well, here you go. This is pretty awesome. Except it's not because the Slave 1 is slow and awkward to handle. Hey, remember that mission on Geonosis where you got to pile of the Jedi Starfighter? Don't you wish you could use it on other missions too? Well, all you gotta do is enter in these two cheat codes and BAM! Jedi Starfighter! Although it is only limited to certain levels. How about a Naboo Starfighter? Well, maybe not this one because it's in shambles. You can be a Naboo Starfighter if you want. Not sure why you would, considering it comes from the worst Star Wars film. But the best unlockable vehicle has to be this. This classic convertible is a relic from a galaxy far, far away. Equipped with cluster seeker missiles, this extremely heavy armored vehicle is perfect for beating the poodoo out of any Imperial forces. Yes, that's right. That is a 1969 Buick Electra, flying through space, disabling Star Destroyers, shooting down TIE Fighters, and heck, it even takes out the Super Star Destroyer. Huh, don't seem to remember that from the film. Maybe it's from the special edition. Outside of the main game, there's also a mode where you can play the original Star Wars arcade games. Pretty cool stuff, and a great way to see where the endless Star Wars games got their start. But the best part outside of the main game is the cooperative mode. Here, you get to play the missions from Rogue Squadron 2, Rogue Leader, with a second player. This is freaking awesome! If I had a second player, yeah, try doing the Death Star Trench Run with two controllers. Not so easy. So, Star Wars Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike. How does it hold up today? Well, quite well as a matter of fact. If you ignore the on-foot sections, this is a pretty good game amongst the countless Star Wars games that exist. 
However, it is the last of the Rogue Squadron series, and if you ask me, Rogue Leader is the superior game. So this begs the question, Rogue Squadron 4, will it ever happen? Can it ever happen? Well, a fourth Rogue Squadron game does in fact exist, but it was never released. To cut a long story short, Factor 5 was facing pressure from LucasArts to break their exclusivity deal with Nintendo due to Rebel Strike's poor sales figures and instead start developing for the Xbox. The plan was to port all three Rogue Squadron games in a remastered compilation, but halfway through production, the project was cancelled due to LucasArts' poor financial status. Rebel Strike would be Factor 5's second to last game, with their last one being the PS3 exclusive Lair released in 2007. In 2008, Factor 5 faced bankruptcy and transferred all of their assets to a separate company unbeknownst to many Factor 5 employees. It was amidst this financial turmoil where the remastered compilation of Rogue Squadron was in fact completed. Not for the Xbox, mind you, but for the Wii. But the game was never released due to shady business deals and the negative PR that would come from it. If you want to know more, I suggest looking up Unseen 64's video on cancelled Star Wars games. That means that somewhere, deep within the now-defunct LucasArts archives and in the hands of only a few X-Factor 5 employees, there exists a fourth Rogue Squadron game, and I would love to play it. But what does it matter? None of these games are canon anyway. So, let's just hope that these new Star Wars films at least make reference to the previous material. <laughs> Spoiler alert! They won't! Come here for a sec. I've got too much Lego. When those wankers wobble, they're sitting ducks ready to shit you want to pull on them. Could you write I Huff Hobo Chode on their foreheads with lipstick? You could, but it wouldn't help you win Death Watch. Those pills are great when you wash them down with a little scotch. I like to wash down my scotch with a little scotch. I like to wash down the scotch that I poured that scotch with with a little more scotch. I like scotch. I like scotch. And do they sound familiar? They should. They were voiced by none other than Greg Proops and John DiMaggio.